Say Something, a video podcast so you can listen and watch. It's like sports talk or news talk, but it's life talk to help us walk the road together. I'm Kay, and thanks for joining me and a few of my friends as we contemplate societal issues and ideas, searching for truth so that together we can say something encouraging to folks walking alongside. On today's show, the very wise Chuck Bentley joins us to chat about balance and perspective when the world around us feels unsettling. Whether it be a pandemic, racial tensions, political turmoil, financial uncertainties, even family disagreement, can we find solid ground? Chuck offers insight and points to hope. Even on on social media, we think, oh, I'm just going to throw it up on social media and, and I can sort of rant and vent. But what happens is it creates a cycle of a similar response. But if I listen and I show respect, and I'm kind to people who differ with me, even though I don't like what they say, and they have strongly held beliefs, and I have strongly held beliefs, love is what will calm the waters, and we need calm waters. Thanks for joining the conversation. Here we go. Okay, so everybody, this is, well, Cynthia, our friend Cynthia from Pardon the Mess podcast, who's always so great. These sweet friends that travel the road with me, who I'm sure have cringed at the thought that they are my friend. <laughs> and Chuck included. Chuck Bentley, Chief Executive Officer for Cram Financial Ministries, has a relentless passion to travel the globe, teaching biblical financial principles to stewards from all walks of life, including the affluent, middle class, poor, and ultra poor. He is a highly sought after speaker, a film producer, and author of five books. His latest, Seven Gray Swans, was published in January 2021. Chuck and his wife, Anne, have four sons and four grandchildren and live in Knoxville, Tennessee. Find Chuck at crown.org. With things going on in the world the way that they are today, it has an unsettledness nature about it. And you have friends disagreeing with friends. You even have family members disagreeing with family members. And so Chuck put a post up on Facebook that started with these words, no need to panic. So we wanted Chuck to just come on and and share some of uh, his wisdom that's just so solid and steady on how we can, uh, how can we, how we can walk through these waters uh, that feel funny these days after a long year of COVID and a lot of uh, unrest and unsettledness to be able to fully live and walk alongside each other. So Thank you for coming, Chuck. That's the longest introduction ever. <laughs> well, thank you, Kay. I just want to tell you how much we loved you. I've known you since you were a little girl. Yes. And uh, I've loved watching you grow into uh, the person you are today, the mother, the wife, the, the influencer. God's used you in a great way, and we're so proud of you. And you're filled with grace. And you are calm, and we need your voice. And so this is fun for me. And Cynthia, thank you for helping us out. Well, thanks for having me. I'm just glad to sit in and take in some knowledge. I'm staying out of the way as much as possible today, guys. I know. Cynthia is full of great knowledge. So what a fun group of happy people. (laughs) I wrote in uh, September about the potential for a perfect storm. Mm. And what I saw happening was we had the pandemic you know, we're all shut down. We're not doing the normal things that we do that are sort of distracting to our lives. So we're a little bit on edge from that. We have an economic crisis that we're not sure how we're going to get through that with all the shut, the lockdowns and the industries that are hurting. And then I said in September, I think we're going into the most contentious election or political season that we've ever seen. And, Mm -hmm. you know, I, you don't have to be very smart to see that coming. Uh, But that perfect storm came and we're in the midst of this great feeling of uncertainty. And I feel it. People in my family feel it. We we all sense, my goodness, the earth is kind of moving beneath our feet. And, uh, you know, Kay, I I was prepared for this. And I'd been telling people it's not a time to panic, Mm -hmm. that this is a time that we can truly be storm proof is the word I'm using. Our house is built on a rock. And, you know, the rock, whether you're built on the rock or the sand, you both are going to get the storm. So God didn't promise us that we would miss the storm. He just said, you will not be destroyed by the storm. And I started sharing some thoughts that were calming to my heart. Number one, mm-hmm. I've never had my hope in, in politics. Have you? <laughs> Any- <laughs> no. <laughs> I've lived long enough to know that they come and go. You know, they're very temporal, no matter how 
strong they may seem or how uh, much uh, good they have done. Uh, politicians come and go, but the kingdom of God lasts forever. And our citizenship is not here. And so no matter who is in control or who's in uh, power at the time, uh, our, our citizenship doesn't change. And I deal with people and work with people all over the world. And some of them live under communism. Some of them live yeah. under dictators. Some of them live under a collapsing economy. And I have found that those people teach me not to worry, <laughs> that they've endured it and they still have joy and they still have, uh, they're centered. And I think, why am I so unsettled when I have friends in far worse circumstances who are experiencing the joy of the Lord? Hmm, I love that. And so one of the things that you said is our values of humility, integrity, and kindness are grace are more important now than ever. And so how do we tap into those to be able to like proactively engage in these scenarios that are unsettling? Well, the Bible te teaches us two things, that we should not be easily angered. Love right. is not easily angered. Okay, years ago, I, I, I asked one of my teenage boys to read 1 Corinthians 13 and evaluate me according to it. <laughs> it was- wow really the most vulnerable, we just weren't getting along. And I said, how am I doing? Because I thought I was doing really well. And he said, dad, you don't get past love is patient. Wow. And it really opened up a better relationship because I, I wanted to know what I was doing that triggered him. Well, look, that first Corinthians 13 applies to politics. And we need to be patient and listen to each other. We need to be not easily angered just because someone disagrees with us. And I think kindness is, you know, the, the Proverbs say that a gentle word turns aside wrath. Mm -hmm. And so I, I know in my marriage that a gentle word is a lot better than being harsh or critical or snappy. Anne has a term for me. She calls it, you're getting short. <laughs> And she doesn't like it when I'm just sort of firing back at her. Uh, my, what I think is kind answers. She wants me to be not so short with her. Mm -hmm. And so kindness is what is needed in this political uh, strife that we're in. Even on, on social media, we think, oh, I'm just going to throw it up on social media and, and I can sort of rant and vent. But what happens is it creates a cycle of a similar response. So if I post a meme that puts down their party and they post a meme that puts down my party, nothing good's been accomplished. Mm -hmm. Not one thing. But if I listen and I show respect and I'm kind to people who differ with me, even though I don't like what they say and they have strongly held beliefs and I have strongly held beliefs, love is what will calm the waters. And we need calm waters. Mm -hmm. I, I do not like all the talk that, you know, we, we are patriots and we've got to sort of silence the other side. That's not patriotism. We're built upon a, a democracy where we hear each other and we, we find compromise so that we can move forward. And I'm going to advocate that on social media and all my spheres of influence, Kay, because I think people of God are called to be peacemakers. Mm -hmm. Not compromisers, but peacemakers. And, and we can do that very actively through social media and using our voice in a peaceful, loving way. Yeah. yeah, I think that's such a good word. And I know, I think all of us agree with that. And hopefully most believers agree with that too. And then sometimes when we're trying to implement, it gets harder because we get in the middle of it and we have emotions that are real. And I wonder just if you could speak into maybe the role that compassion plays as well, because I started thinking about the need for me to be compassionate in these situations because our, our house is built on the firm foundation, but a lot are not. And so people that have been relying on politics for their steadfastness, or they've been relying on finances, or their health, or science and vaccines, and you start going through this. I mean, when this starts crumbling, the last year has been incredibly difficult. I think coming back to that place of compassion and being able to say, okay, there's no need to engage in this or if anything. Let's come back and just say, oh, this is hard. How can I walk with you? And so I would just love to hear your thoughts on that. How does compassion play into our response in, in 
alongside with love. Well, Cynthia, I think compassion and empathy are the basis for love. When uh, someone is hurt or wounded or fearful, uh, you know, if we if they're our child, what what are we going to do? We're going to we're going to try to comfort them and deal with the root issue that's causing them that fear or or great anxiety. Anxiety is endemic right now. It's it's yeah. just contagious. Yeah. And I feel for people who are worried about the future of this country, just like I am. They're just worried about it from a different perspective. And I, I understand that it's unsettling to them to think things could go radically the other way that they don't think is the best way. And so when I empathize with them, I have a much greater probability of having influence in their life. You know, if you want someone to listen to you, you have to listen first. Listening creates a willingness for to be heard. Mm -hmm. And so I'm trying to put that into practice. I'm trying to have the conversations where people are, where I'm listening to them first. I love that you brought up willingness because this last year I've been working on um, just a, actually it's a new book that it's coming out in May, but it's dealing with mercy, kindness, and, um, and thankfulness. And the thing about, there was a Jesuit priest who, who titled, who gave the de definition of mercy as the willingness to enter into someone else's chaos. And um, willingness is such a big part of it. Um, I think that willingness and the compassion are so critical because it gives dignity to everyone involved, which is really what you're talking about, like being able to meet someone where they are. Because, you know, I think sometimes we forget that everyone is a person, <laughs> like yeah. a person with great worth. And um, every person has a history that is different from each other, even if you're even if you live in the same house. Because I find that, to me, that's some of the hardest part is the unsettledness that's within families. You know, Kay, my father taught me that every person is carrying an invisible load of rocks. Mm. And they've got this their own burden, their own sense of exhaustion about what they've had to deal with. Yeah. And a lot of times, we just don't think about people that way. And yeah. We dehumanize them over political issues or... Uh, maybe a different perspective in life. I'll, I'll tell you a quick story, Kay. I, I was serving in a, helping people with their finances in a country in Africa. And I met a lady who introduced herself by telling me that she was the village prostitute. And wow. I remember thinking that's not a way most people would introduce themselves. But I sat and got to know Elena. And she told me that she uh, had been sick and unable to work, which was true. She had hungry children, and she got to the point in her life that she only had one thing that she could sell to feed her children. Mm. And I remember thinking, this is why Jesus said to drop your stones. Mm -hmm. You know, she wasn't doing that because she wanted to. And I remember in her village, I looked around and I thought about her clientele and the humiliation that she had to live with. Yeah. And I loved this person. I, I, was, I was proud of her ability to admit she didn't want to be doing this, and, and, and yet she felt stuck. And I said, Elena, I'm going to commit to help you, whatever I can do, that you never have to do that again. And we've stayed friends for years. And uh, when I see her, like four years later, five years later, she always gives me one of these. Okay. And because she doesn't do that anymore. Mm -hmm. And I remember thinking if I were harsh or judgmental or pious or arrogant or self-righteous, uh, I wouldn't have entered into her chaos. So I love the description, Kay. That's what God wants us to do is enter into their chaos and be a friend to them. Yeah. So Which goes along, one of your things where it said, break out of the we versus they paradigm and love your neighbor. You know, the genocide in Rwanda was caused by this idea that there's a group that's better than the other. So yeah. it was a we versus they construct. And, and they just started hating each other. The media told them to hate each other. Uh, we're seeing a lot of that right now. Every time I hear some spokesperson that I may totally agree with, uh, they start condemning the other side like they're bad, they're the enemy, they're wrong, they're they're obstructionists, 
they're not for freedom. They're, 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 you know, and we're just pointing our finger at them as opposed to seeing their humanity and listening and being uh, willing to find common ground. And God used an extreme example in loving our neighbor with the, the, the Samaritan that he chose. You know, he chose a trigger story of one that you would typically reject uh, to say that's your neighbor. Yeah. You've mentioned also how prayer is more important than ever and just feeding back into prayer. And you mentioned earlier something you learned growing up from a parent. And I just remember my mom always saying to me that if you're struggling with a person or, or just don't like somebody, like start praying for them because that just changes your whole posture. And that sounds, you know, kind of old, something maybe we all know, simplistic, but really in this time, how important is prayer? Well, I think that worry is the indicator that it's time to pray. It's like the red light going off on the dashboard. Anytime I'm worried, it's like the Lord reminded me, are you going to cast that burden on me? Are you going to just worry about it? And a lot of times we think worry is a replacement for prayer. I don't know if you've ever done that, but you've spent an hour worrying about something. You think, (laughs) oh, I must have been praying about that. Yes, yes. (laughs) And you really haven't. I like to tell people, don't think about praying. Don't wish you were praying. Pray. Pray, really pray. When Caleb posted that your father was sick, I, I started praying. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we're thrilled to get the good news. But prayer invests your life in the outcome. It's like making a, a purchase of a stock. Now you're super interested in what's going to happen. And I think that's why God says pray about all these things that worry you. So that now you're invested and you're, and you're hopeful. And you've activated faith. I posted, uh, Cynthia, that I believe faith is more valuable right now than Bitcoin. <laughs> wow. Because, you know, there's a mad rush to Bitcoin. But really, faith is going to endure longer than Bitcoin. And it's going to serve us well. And if I can be centered and I can be storm ready and I can be a calming agent, then I know God is using me for good at that moment. But if I'm multiplying fear and strife and anger, that's not God's way. Amen. Okay, so as people feel this fear, I was at a swim meet the other, well, just this week. And um, the gal that was next to me said, you know, I haven't slept. I'm not sleeping. Because I actually think people aren't sleeping because of just the, wherever wherever you're going um, with these things. And so um, how do you encourage somebody? to be able to like proactively, you know, solid steps. She's just walking alongside next to me and she matters. And so how do we encourage each other as we enter into these issues that are challenging? Well, first of all, Kay, the vast majority of what we're worried about will never happen. Right. And a lot of times if we will inventory in writing what we're really, really worried about Mm -hmm. and we extrapolate it out to worst case scenario type scenario analysis, Mm -hmm. it's just not going to happen that way. And we can back down off the ledge of that sort of extreme fear that, that gets sort of circulating in our mind and just say, okay, that's probably not going to happen. The second thing is if it does, especially for people of faith, God promises to work even that for our good. And so sleep is a really important part of our health and Ann and I've had to work at it during this time. We've had to really get proactive with some practices called sleep hygiene, you know, where you, you set up a regime to get ready to go to bed and you, you have practices where you, you know, you turn up, you get away from the screens, you, you get away from all the noise and you allow yourself to decompress. And we've started reading history and history takes us out of the present and it gives us better perspective. And it gives us uh, an opportunity for our minds to rest so that our mind and soul get renewed for the battle the next day. We will read scripture. Anna and I quote scripture to one another a lot of times before bed. We, we, we have a, some scripture that she says part of it and I say part of it. And it just brings this connection that we're going to sleep, but God isn't. He's going to be up all night and he'll be there when our eyes open in the morning. Mm-hmm. Good That's beautiful. That's beautiful. Can I go off topic for one second? Ask a question, Kay, Chuck? Sure. <laughs> I'm going off topic. What's behind you, Chuck? That picture 
that has, what's the significance of that? Or is there any? I'm looking at that behind you and it's it's caught my eye the whole time. Well, thank you. The first trip I ever took to Tanzania where Kay's sister is That's uh, right. now serving. <laughs> and uh, Tanzania was my first mission trip. And I bought that from a, a local artist who painted the Maasai villagers. They are the tribal, tribal and they're the ones that jump up and down. And this was a, a, an original that I just thought he had a very creative way of, of showing his culture. And it brings back fond memories of my love for the African people. I love that. I love that. It's so pretty. I just saw that. I thought I need to ask about that. Yeah, thank so you. So good. Okay, so Chuck, we've, we've heard you say, listen, like that's absolutely one of the first things to do. You look at your eyes on someone else and, and to ab- actually give dignity to the human being walking next to you. Forget about the us versus them. Go yeah. for kindness. Like really and truly today, you can proactively do something that's kind. I mean, you really actually can. And the amazing thing about it is that it makes everyone feel better, which ushers in peace. And so um, we love to ask our guests, um, what are their tips to a joy-filled life? And so I'm thinking that those are probably a few of them, but what else would you throw in to us? Because joy isn't circumstantial, it's steady. Yeah, I love that, Kay. And Anne and I've been thinking about it because we're living with this pale of of death in the in in the whole world right now. There's a, mm-hmm. a fog of our temporalness that sort of seized all of our lives. And so what we've begun to do is to say out loud the things that cannot be lost or oh. stolen, or yeah. taken from us, no matter what happens. Mm-hmm. And we verbalize these things, and we typically do it on a walk. So I'll give you an example. Uh, we'll be walking, and I'll say, Lord, thank you for that beautiful tree, or those flowers, or that little squirrel that just made my day the way it was running and wiggling its tail. Thank you for this beautiful night sky. Thank you for uh, thank you for the weather. Thank you for that I'm at peace right now. Thank you. I have such abundance and comfort. Thank you that I have children that I love and grandchildren you've given us. Thank you. My father's still alive and I can call him and we can text each other. Thank you. I have a wonderful wife. Thank you that we get to hold each other every morning. Our bed is comfortable and that you've given us uh, coffee that we can look forward to when we wake up. And we just go through all these funny little things, Kay. And after a while, we're just happy again. Mm-hmm. We're, we're out of that grind that, oh, the world's falling apart and it's going to cave in on me. And, I'm, you know, things are going to get worse. All of that is infectious. But you can counterbalance it by saying the things that are really mm-hmm. true. And look, we are doing this right now. I told Ann, I just look forward to waking up, saying what we've been blessed by, being next to her, and knowing that nothing can separate us from the love of God. Mm-hmm. I um, I love that you do that, Chuck, because I heard recently someone mention something similar to that and doing it through the alphabet. Just pick, start with A and something you're thankful for as you're walking, as you're out and about all the way through. And so I have the attention span of a gnat some days when I'm walking, I feel like I'm all over the place. And so just praying and praising God through the alphabet, and it's it's about it's it's the way to do it. I love that. So that's a good word for all of us. I just think, and Kay is so good at this, but gratitude, gratitude. It just, mm-hmm. if that, if you can be anchored and rooted in gratitude, it just changes your perspective on everything. And I'm just thankful for your encouragement in that. And then friends like Kay, who are always show such gratitude and grace and kindness. It's just a gift. Yeah, thank you, Cynthia. And I do believe that uh, the joy of the Lord is our strength. And that means that it's not my joy that mm-hmm. we actually get to share in his joy. Mm. And when we sort of take that out of, okay, I'm not joyful, but God is, and Mm -hmm. I need to invite his joy into my life, it really does help in the dark days. And I recognize that these are are times of great anxiety for many people, and I don't want to minimize that. But we do have the Lord who will share his joy with us. I think that's a great point to recognize it because people are tired. And I think that, it, you know, outing that really helps to be able to go to give yourself a little bit of grace and go, I may be short because honestly, I'm exhausted because I think people really have been on edge, just like what's going to happen next? When is this going to be over? And just the unsettled nature 
of things that are going on. And so I love that. So joy by hitting the thankful train. And one thing I love about you even going through all that, the greatest thing about thankfulness is you get started and good luck stopping. (laughs) It just keeps (laughs) going. (laughs) And it does, you know, physically, physiologically, it does something in your brain. So which is terrific. And perspective. So I love both of those. Any anything else on the joy? You know, Anne is so good at it. She will say uh, when we're because we do this, Kay. I mean, I'm not making a illustration. She'll say, "Thank you for these Hoka tennis shoes that make my knees feel better, and thank you, I got them for a sixty percent discount." You know, yes. she gets really, really specific. I and, love it, and it's and it's so fun to be able to do that. And and when we're finished with that part of our walk, we literally feel renewed. Mm-hmm. We've gotten fresh air. We've gotten vitamin D that we need. We've been out in God's creation. Mm -hmm. And all of those things help us to shed some of that anxiety. And look, I don't mind mentioning, Kay, I get it as well. Mm -hmm. And when I'm getting short, I have to just admit to Ann, okay, it's getting to me. (laughs) I haven't haven't been around people and I'm an extrovert and and I get claustrophobic. And, you know, all those things work on us. Yeah. And she has to say, okay, okay, I understand. Let me help you through that. Yeah, Mm. so good. So meeting people where they are, including yourself. Yeah, that's good. good. Thank you for that, Kay. I love that. All right, so um, we only have you for a few short more minutes. And I just want to tell people that you've written a new book. One of Chuck's, you know, One of Chuck's greatest areas of wisdom has been in the financial world. And I know that that is a very stressful, legit stressful thing for people right now is just their personal finances, even all that comes along with the past and what's in the future. And so can you just give us a little taste of this book that's called The Seven Grace Wands? So tell us just a little bit about it. Well, it's a departure from the personal finance space that I usually write in. It's really more of a macroeconomic look at trends. And I've been tracking these trends that I call a gray swan, which means they're an obvious threat, but we tend to ignore them. They sort of blend into the background. And it's it's become a book that people who are interested in sort of where we are headed and how to get prepared for that have really appreciated. I, I think it's really one of my better works. I've written a lot of books now, and this one is sort of future casting where I think it's going to go. And it's not all bad. You know, there's right. there's threats, but there's also things that are mitigating those threats that I personally like to be aware of. And that's why I wrote the book, Kay. It's super interesting. I, ch- I checked it out last night, and I do... Being an MBA in my, like, somewhere way back there, before I donated all the brain cells that apparently never come back to these children. <laughs> it is really interesting. And nothing to be afraid of, yeah. but things to walk confidently into. Because it goes back to where you started with these words that I just loved. Again, there's no need to panic. <laughs> yeah. So as we go, can you just, um, can you take us out on a, on a good word? Yeah, okay. The, the fact that we panic is an indication that we have temporarily sort of separated from our faith and taken the responsibility for that problem before us or that stressor before us on ourselves. Mm-hmm. And I, I look at panic as an indication that I need to truly draw closer to the Lord by faith and accept the fact that I can't figure out tomorrow. I can't see through this glass. It's foggy. And God wants me to recognize that. And I am, that I am coming up short in being able to figure out how to solve those problems, whether it's with my children or my marriage or my finances or global affairs, right? I just come up short and I need him. And when I do feel panicked, I I can come back to the fact that we trust in a God that is able to solve all problems and to work them all together for good. My mom had a business card that had her name on one side and Roman 828 on the other side. And she lived that God will work all things together for good. And Kay, when she died, I remember thinking she was one of the richest women I ever knew Mm -hmm. because she always believed no matter what she went through, which was a lot, 
that God would redeem it for good purposes. And I just have learned to live that way, Kay, and I hope others will as well. Mm, I love that. I have a friend that does prayers, like breathing in and breathing out. And it just made me think about that even as as you said that, to be able to go, God can, as you breathe in and work all things to good as you breathe out. I mean, whatever it is, whatever verse helps you, um, it will certainly breathe a little life and into your moment, into your day, as you have for us, Chuck, and so many. And uh, Cynthia, it's always yes. a blast being with you, girl. And oh, thank you. Guys, I need a new, I need a new business card, everyone. That got me there at the end. I think it's time for some business cards. Thank you, Chuck. So, so encouraging. So, oh, thank you. I, I just, thank you. I was so blessed by my mother's example. Uh, she never had. She didn't get an education. She dropped out in grade school or, or middle school. Mm. Uh, she felt inferior most of her life to other people. And yet at her funeral, there were so many tears because she lived with love for anyone. And uh, I just feel so blessed to have had a mother that taught me to love people, even those that don't like me. And she's my example and inspiration. So beautiful. Thank you. What a good word. Thank you, Cynthia. Thank you, Kay. I appreciate you both and what you're doing. And thank you for the, the way that you're influencing so many people during this important time. Wow. Walking it together is a lot better than going it alone. That's for sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> okay. So you guys, we thank you for walking it with us. And so even today, we pray and hope that you will be encouraged by something here and be able to go say something encouraging to the person walking alongside you. Because the amazing thing about that is that we get to hear it too. So until next time, thanks you guys. Our very special thanks to Chuck Bentley. Connect with Chuck at crown.org and check out Chuck's latest book, Seven Gray Swans. And as always, thanks to Cynthia Yanoff with Pardon the Mets podcast. Check it out on iHeartRadio and iTunes and anywhere podcasts are found. And a very special thanks to you. Want to stay connected? Visit saysomethingshow.com and sign up to our mailing list or check us out on YouTube, follow us on Instagram, like us on Facebook, listen on Apple Podcasts, or check out our channel on Truly Media. See you next time on Say Something.